Did you know? Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts wasn't the first version of the game Rare attempted to develop, it actually ended up being their third attempt over several years of brainstorming. A third Banjo-Kazooie game was teased as early as the year 2000, when series antagonist Gruntilda threatened Banjo and friends at the end of Banjo-Tooie saying, Just you wait until Banjo-3. Although the core Banjo team's next project after Banjo-Tooie was grabbed by the Ghoulies, there is some evidence that a third game was at least considered for the GameCube. The biggest clue being a tech demo shown off by Rare at Space World 2000, featuring the Banjo-Kazooie cast in a new engine. Though this was during a time where the gaming industry was going through some big changes. What could once be done with a small team on the Nintendo 64 would now take a larger team and budget for the new console generation. Rare's co-founders, Tim and Chris Stamper, had expected Nintendo to buy Rare outright, making them a first-party development studio and combating the rising costs. To their surprise, that never happened, and they were instead bought by Microsoft in 2002. All of Rare's intellectual properties were also bought with the company, including Banjo-Kazooie, and any GameCube projects were either cancelled or made their way to the Xbox. The game that eventually became Nuts and Bolts, while referencing the events of the previous games, was never intended to be a straight sequel. When the team started work on a new Banjo-Kazooie game for the Xbox hardware, codenamed Banjo-X, they initially planned to do a complete remake of the original game. This game would have shared a basic structure with its predecessor, but also introduced new challenges and changed old ones in ways that would surprise even series veterans. As the game started to take form, however, the team became concerned that players would see it as a mere graphical update to the original and that it might be hard to sell as a result. The team got as far as revamping Mumbo's Mountain before taking the game in a new direction, and little else was known about this build until August of 2015. Former Rare designer Steve Mayle shared models of Mumbo's Mountain characters Conga and Ticker, which, among other things, showed that the game adopted an angular style well before Nuts and Bolts. A more conventional model of Mumbo himself was made a year prior to test out lip-syncing with the character. The second concept Rare put into development was also planned to be a traditional platformer, but would feature a more direct rivalry between the protagonists and Gruntilda. The plan was to allow Grunty to interfere with the player's progress by having her complete the same tasks as the player, from collecting items to solving puzzles. Rare foresaw that the level of complexity needed for Grunty's AI would cause issues down the road, so they scrapped the idea and changed direction yet again. For their third attempt, the team decided to create a game similar to previous entries while still doing something new with the 3D platforming genre. In an interview, designer Greg Mayles said, The next idea was looking at how players travel in platform games. How can we make the traveling to the objective as fun as the objective itself? The team always wanted to make a game where the player was able to construct things, and it was Tim Stamper who had the idea of allowing the player to use blocks to build their own vehicles, an idea that eventually became the focus of Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. The game would originally include levels from the previous games, with new features built in to work with the driving mechanic. The first prototype was set in Mumbo's Mountain, though the final product ended up having all new locations. When it came to Banjo and Kazooie's character designs, the team experimented with several art styles and tried to update the duo without losing what made them so special. The team did try using high resolution versions of the N64 models, but they felt the original charm just wasn't there. Artist Ed Bryan suggested a design that embraced both smooth surfaces and hard edges, feeling it retained the duo's history while being a perfect fit for the game's theme of construction. Nuts and Bolts wasn't the first game in the series that had a difficult development process. The story of the first Banjo-Kazooie game's development is just as interesting, starting life as an isometric adventure game for the Super Nintendo, codenamed Project Dream. Inspired by the likes of the Zelda series and LucasArts point-and-click games, Dream was going to be Rare's magnum opus on the system, with ACM graphics going beyond that of Donkey Kong Country. Taking place in a fantastical world, the game starred a boy named Edison and his dog Dinger. The two embark on an adventure and get tangled up with a group of pirates led by the infamous Captain Black Eye, who had a dog of his own named Ripper. This build of the game was only worked on for a few months before development shifted to the recently released N64, and the game changed drastically after the move to new hardware. It received a more mature tone to reach a wider audience, with the pirate motif gradually replacing the fairy tale themes, and it wasn't long before Edison himself fell out of favor with the team as well. As designer Greg Mayles put it, Edison over this time kind of started to lose his relevance 
experience. The world was changing around him and we still had this young guy with a wooden sword. We started exploring alternatives to a boy. Originally starting off with a rabbit, to which Greg thought was a bad idea, they soon settled on the design of a humanoid bear with a backpack to store his equipment. This character would go through a few iterations before becoming the banjo we know today. Development on Dream continued for another 16 months, in which time Rare realized that the title was becoming too ambitious for the small team to handle. The game was mostly scrapped, save for Banjo as the team grew fond of him. It was then decided to reimagine the game completely, centering it around the new protagonist. The game took on the form of a 2.5D platformer, following the formula of Rare's Donkey Kong Country games, and the game's title changed from Dream to Kazoo. A snapshot of this build even showed up in the final product, previously thought to have been from a scrapped level called Fungus Forest. When experimenting with Banjo's character design, the team thought of giving him a skateboarder look, and even made some of his animations reflect the aesthetic, but these didn't stick for long. This build would have also used balls as power-ups and had a fruit-based system which featured five different fruit houses, integral to solving jigsaw puzzles. Kazooie didn't exist at this point, but her creation stemmed from the idea of giving Banjo a double jump. The team wanted a double jump that could believably be done anywhere, giving players more flexibility. They had the idea of wings sprouting out of Banjo's backpack, which soon led to a set of legs for traversing areas, and eventually, a full character who lived in the backpack itself. The game then became known as Banjo Kazoo, but Kazoo gave the team trademark issues, so adding an IE to the name, it became Banjo Kazooie. It was at this point that the team got a true sense of direction for their game. After being inspired by an early build of Super Mario 64, Rare changed direction one last time and redesigned Banjo Kazooie to be more in line with what Mario was doing. And within one week of scrapping the old game, an entire level of the new game went from concept to completion. That level being Mumbo's Mountain, the first stage in the final release of Banjo Kazooie, and in another 16 months, the game was done. As the Banjo-Kazooie series evolved, each game left its share of mechanics on the cutting room floor, the most well-known of these being the fabled stop and swap feature. Rare discovered by accident that if you took a cartridge out of the N64 while the power was on, remnants of the game's data would still be in the console's RAM for a short time. Rare wanted to reward players with unlockable items by swapping the cartridges between certain games, hinted at with Donkey Kong 64. Performing a specific glitch triggers an unused cutscene, panning to a corner in DK's treehouse and and transporting the player to Crystal Caves. An early screenshot of the game showed that same corner once had a Banjo-Kazooie themed shower stall. There's also text in DK64's data referring to the Ice Key, an item linked to Banjo-Kazooie's stop and swap. Because of these connections, it's thought that the key would have been used to access a secret area from DK's treehouse. Rare didn't tell Nintendo about this feature until Banjo-Kazooie was nearly finished, thinking Nintendo wouldn't need to know. To which Nintendo told them the idea wasn't guaranteed to work in all cases for the N64 due to variations in newly manufactured consoles. This, coupled with concern of players damaging their cartridges, led to the feature being dropped, which is why remnants of it are still in the games, albeit useless. Stop and Swap wasn't the only major feature to be cut in a Banjo game. The final world from Banjo-Tooie was greatly cut down from its initial design. Cauldron Keep would have been a more fleshed out castle level, featuring a graveyard and treasure chamber. It would have also had 10 jiggies to find, but the team ran out of time and had to scale the level back. This is why Banjo-Tooie has only 90 jiggies total compared to Banjo-Kazooie's 100. Banjo-Kazooie was also planned to have full voice acting, but the team realized recording speech would greatly increase development time. To counter this, they initially had an idea called Bubble Speak, where dialogue was conveyed via Thought Bubble, being a funnier alternative to text and more unilingual. Eventually, they spliced up sound clips to make the noises, most being done by the game's composer, Grant Kirkhope. Dream was heavily themed around its music, and as a carryover, Banjo had a musical motif as well. Characters were even going to sing to introduce themselves in the game's opening, but that idea was dropped. This intro was also originally done in motion capture, but it was decided animating it by hand would make a better product. The little shimmy Banjo did was kept in though, as the team liked it. While the main characters were named after musical instruments, several other names came from members of the team simply messing around with each other. The name of banjo Tui's boss, Wu Fak Fak, is a reference to a rare programmer who, according to colleagues, would swear when he was having programming issues, and when overcoming a problem would exclaim, Woo! Banjo's Goldfish Royston got his name from one of the game's artists who had that as a middle name, so they put it in the game out of pity, and at his expense. Royston's also made surprise appearances in other rare games such as Ghoulies and Viva Pinata. Even Banjo-Kazooie's spiritual successor, Yuka Laylee, has a nod to the fish in the character Dr. Puzz, both of which were designed by Ed Bryan. 
Did you also know that Nintendo gave out free beer and condoms to promote Conker's Bad Fur Day? Or that the Great Mighty Pooh was actually inspired by one of Rare's developers having a legendary bowel movement? For more Conker facts, click the annotation on screen to watch the Did You Know Gaming video on Conker. Don't forget to subscribe to Did You Know Gaming for more facts and trivia. And if you liked this video, give it a like and a share. And if you want to see one of my videos, here's one I did about the first three Pokemon movies and the writer behind them. People say they're the best films in the series, and this video sheds light on why folks think that, as well as the stories and themes the head writer wanted to tell with them. These films are about a lot more than just Pokemon, I'll tell you that much. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it, and uh, I'm gonna get out of here now. See ya!